All right, hey guys, Stephen from LOJ back again here with John from PSI Conversion. And um, we're going to talk now about the controllers, the electronic perspective of what it takes to, to run a Gen 3 LS engine. So if you're curious about what um, is a Gen 3 LS engine, I'd encourage you to look back through some previous videos. I've got one that describes the physical characteristics of a Gen 3, how you can identify if you have a Gen 3 motor. But now we're going to talk about what it takes to actually retain factory style EFI in a swap with one of these motors. Sure. So the, the, the big characteristic change on the electronic side for these is the computers. So um, in 1997, when the LS1 came out in the Corvette, that had its own controller. Okay. Then in 1998, it came out in the F-Body, that had a new controller. Okay. Um, these, both these controllers are what we call red and blue PCM. So if you look at the, if you look at the harness that hooks up to it, it would have a red PCM connector, a powertrain control module connector any blue PCM connector. Um, those were used, the, even though the computer part numbers changed, in 1999, they standardized the pinout, and then from 99 to two, roughly 2002, uh, GM used that on the trucks and on the Corvette, the Camaro, and the Firebird. Um, the most popular of those controllers is what we call the 411 controller. It's the last three numbers of the service number. Um, those controllers are capable of running drive-by cable or drive-by wire. It can do both. Right. Um, in 2003, GM started using the green and blue computer. And that was primarily used in all the trucks. Uh, then the Corvette went to it sometime in 2003. They went from the 411 to the green and blue computer and they used that up until they got to the Gen 3 and a half LS2. Yeah. Um, the green and blue computer and uh, was primarily a drive-by wire computer depending again on the part number. Now, there are green and blue computers out there that were in vans or in the 2004 GTO. There's one sitting right there actually. Okay, drive that drive-by cable green and blue green and blue computer. computer. Um, but it's uh, it's rare. The operating systems are limited. There are people that are proponents of them because, you know, maybe they have more memory in them or maybe the processor is slightly faster. Um, but for most people uh, we like at PSI, what we like to tell them is, listen, if you're running drive-by cable on a Gen 3 engine, run a red and blue computer. If you're going to run a uh, drive-by wire setup from a truck engine with a truck tack module and a truck, um, and a truck pedal, run the green and blue computer. Now, the green and blue drive-by cable computer and the red and blue drive-by cable computer, they're not interchangeable on the same harness. That is correct. Um, the green and blue computers, uh, there are a couple differences from physical um, from a physical standpoint as far as hooking the wiring harness up. Those primarily are there are extra grounds in the green and blue computer. And then the O2 sensors are um, what we call PCM grounded. They're pulse with mod the grounds are pulse width modulated as opposed to um, chassis a chassis grounded O2 sensor, which is what you typically find on a uh, on a red and blue computer. And it, it, that's key to understand because you do have customers, you know, everybody's trying to save a dollar. You know, they want, they want to reuse certain things. And let's say they're going from a drive-by wire green and blue 2005 truck engine and they say, you know what, I'm going to, a, you know, I'm, I'm throwing an LS6 intake on it with drive-by cable and we sell them a red and blue harness, you know, red and blue computer with harness. They, they'll try sometimes to cut the ends off of our, our harness and use their old O2 sensors. And then all of a sudden their O2 sensors don't work. And the reason is, is because you're using a non-case grounded O2 with a case grounded system or vice versa. Right. And what you have to keep in mind if you're the customer is, you know, whatever our part numbers say inside our, our manual, that's what you should use. And you should replace, it's just like replacing spark plugs on a used engine. You should replace your O2 sensors because yep. they do go bad. And it's going to save you tons of headaches later on down the line when it comes to maybe diagnosing um, a, a drivability issue that you have because you used to use parts or you cut a connector when you probably shouldn't have. And that's one of the reasons why when I sell a swap kit to somebody that I'm including a harness and all with, there's an option to include harness, PCM, O2 sensors, MAF sensor, all of those parts included so you know you're getting new components that are designed to work together so you're not going to have any of these troubleshooting shooting issues when you... You know, go, first go to fire up your engine. And I also want to hit on the, one of the benefits to me with the Gen 3 motor is the fact that you can run them drive-by cable. Because when you're doing a conversion in an older vehicle, like we do Z32 300 ZXs or 
S13 and S14 240SXs. Those cars can drive by cable from the factory. So they've got a pedal that's already set up for a drive by cable system. And if you want to convert to drive by wire in one of those cars, especially with the Gen 3 motor, John touched on it briefly, to run Gen 3 drive by wire, you don't just need a pedal. You need a pedal and you need another box that's called a TAP module, a throttle actuator controller module, Correct. I believe. Correct. So, you know, you've got a car that had one small PCM in it, or ECU as they call them in the Nissan world, which it's different verbiage for the same, same part. Um, now you've got, you're taking out this one small uh, Nissan ECU, then you've already got to fit one of these bigger GM uh, red and blue or red and green ECU somewhere, and then you have to fit a tack module somewhere else as well, and then you have to fabricate a bracket to mount the drive-by-wire throttle pedal to your firewall. It kind of, it creates more work for, honestly, not a lot more benefit. Some tuners will argue that it's easier to tune wild cams with the drive-by-wire ECU. It is to a certain extent. But for 90% of the guys out there, it, it's easier. So when I have customers with or clients that want to do a build in a 300ZX and they're trying to save money, I tell them, stick with the Gen 3 motor, stick with drive back cable setup, makes life easier. That's not to say one is better than the other, but in certain applications, it's certainly easier. Yeah, and, and it's also important to know that if you are going to stay drive by wire, that the components match. Yeah. And those components specifically, you got to make sure that the tack module and the pedal match with the throttle body and with the wiring because you can't just willy-nilly decide that hey I got a good deal over here on this throttle body I got a good deal over here on the pedal and then here's the tack module that came with the engine and then wonder why the pedal doesn't work <laughs> you know we again we're all hot rodders we all want to be you know get the best value we can but you know you got to be certain that the stuff you're using even though it connects together that it's designed to work together yeah. and that's where you know we can help you or, or LOJ can help um, in educating the customer when they call to place an order. We're not just selling you parts, we're selling you the complete service. Right. Now there's some other differences that changed on different Gen 3 motors depending on the application too that we wanted to hit on. I think another one was the injectors. So, you know, depending whether it was a truck or a car or what car, it could have a different injector. Correct, correct. So you have your typical um, car fuel injectors would be your EV1s. And again, this is Gen 3. Your EV1 is your standard looking uh, fuel injector. It's like a perfectly rectangular. Yes, with a metal clip, clip with, with a metal, metal clip on yeah. it. Um, then most of the trucks came with what they call the Moltec injector, which was a very tiny looking injector. Um, it was a plastic. It was all plastic. There was no metal clip on it. And then some of the trucks, as you got you know later down the road into the mid two thousands, they came with what we call the EV six injector, which um, was a flex fuel injector. Uh, later on in the Gen four video that that I'm sure you're going to do, uh, you'll see that the EV six was standard on. Um, all the Gen 4 GM engines. And the EV6 connector also came on the LS2 injectors. And the LS2 injectors, again, are unique to the LS2 only. Yeah. Um, but so it's a tall body injector about the height of an LS1 injector, but it's got the connector of a um, LS3 or Gen 4 style injector. Again, cool. another thing that makes the LS2 a little different than everything else. Correct. And, and the nice thing is, is on our harnesses, we offer that customization to, to our customers. Right. So. If somebody says, hey, I'm running an LS2 intake manifold with drive-by cable on a 6-liter um, out of a truck, an LQ4 and LQ9, we can accommodate the different types of injectors very seamlessly for them. And by we, it, that passes right through to LRJ because PSI is my source for all of the harnesses I sell with my swap kits. So um, we can essentially accommodate any combination of intake manifold um, engine configuration you've got within reason, obviously. If you start crossing Gen 3, Gen 4, it gets a little bit trickier, but even that can be covered too, which we'll talk about more later. Um, some of the other differences, alternators between Gen 3 motors. Yeah, so you, so there's, um, you have a truck alternator, uh, you have the um, you have the Camaro alternator, you have the Corvette alternator. So this is a Corvette Gen 3 alternator right here, actually. That is correct. And I mean, it looks similar, it'll look similar to a Gen 4 alternator, but it'll have the four pin flat connector on it. Um, some of the trucks had a two pin connector alternator on them. And then the GTO also had a, uh, a two pin uh, alternator connector on it. Now see, that's another thing that kind of differentiates my approach to doing swaps from a lot of other companies. So with my 300ZX swap kits and my 350Z swap kits and G35 swap kits, I sell an accessory drive package to keep your factory Nissan alternator right on the car. So 
that wiring I generally remove from one of PSI's harnesses before I ever even send it to a customer because you don't need the GM connector for an alternator. Now, that's not to say I won't sell it to you. Some guys want to run the GM accessories. Let me know when you place your order. I'll make sure the correct alternator connector is there for you. So, um, Gen 3, you also touched on some of the differences in O2s, the case grounded versus chassis grounded. Yeah, the, the O2s, I mean, GM, uh, they used a couple different styles of O2 sensors. You look at the connectors, sometimes they're square, sometimes they're triangular, sometimes they're flat. Um, they're all four wire. Yeah. Uh, sometimes they're male, sometimes they're female. Yep. Uh, there's a lot of differences in the O2 sensors. What we do at PSI is we try to use the most common, and uh, that way it, it kind of takes care of most people. But again, like I said, um, you should be replacing your O2 sensors when you do the swap anyway. Yep. So all you have to do is just don't order your O2 sensors until, you're, until you order the harness, and uh, the part number's right in our instructions. And you know you can, go to, you can order them from us, we do sell them. Uh, you can go to Rock Auto, you can go wherever you want, Amazon, it doesn't matter. Just make sure you use the ones we call out for the harness so you avoid any types of problems down the road. And it is my understanding, though, that, say, um, the, it, the O2 sensor you require is a square four-pin male, um, for instance. I'm not sure if it's male or female, but I'm just, um, don't take that as word. I'm just saying right now, there can be a, um, a square four-pin male O2 sensor with a black connector that was a primary O2 or a secondary O2. If you want to buy a different O2 sensor, because it has a different length lead on it to help your swap. As long as the color and configuration of the connector is the same, it will work. It doesn't matter if it was a primary or a secondary. O2. That is correct. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think on some of my swaps, I actually use secondary O2s as primaries because the width is uh, so short on some of those secondary O2s that it suits routing of wires better. But Yeah, and, and the reason GM did it, I mean, you'll find on certain cars, uh, they might use two or three different types of connectors on the same car and it's really just to pokey yoke the actual harness right. from the factory so people couldn't cross let's say uh, bank one sensor two with bank two sensor one because that's what they wanted to each other in the wide pipe and it could easily be crossed that is correct yeah. that's why they did it that way um, we make it common so that way you buy the same o2 sensor left and right and it's a nice clean install yep um, i think the Last two topics we want to talk about with Gen 3 motors are the transmissions and the map sensors. So um, Gen 3 motors, um, if you're familiar with GM vehicles, uh, when, we're talking, when we talk transmissions, we're talking automatic transmissions. Manuals don't matter because the PCM doesn't care what kind of manual transmissions in the car to a certain extent. There's one, one caveat to that. But So like with a manual transmission, LOJ sells adapters for putting uh, Nissan manual transmissions be behind LS engines. The only thing that matters when doing that is that the speedometer sensor output on the Nissan transmission needs to be fed to the LS PCM so it knows vehicle speed, so it can differentiate between coast down idle or stationary idle, or if it's a drive-by wire setup, it'll go into like a, a fault mode if it's not getting a vehicle speed signal. So um, you need to let us know what transmission you're gonna run behind your motor so that we can program the PCM to accept the correct speedometer output from whatever trains you're running if it's not a GM transmission. Now, the meat of what we really want to talk about, though, is when it comes to automatic transmissions. Um, Gen 3 motors only had four-speed automatic transmissions behind them, correct? That is correct. So you had your 4L60E and your 4L80E, and then the you know you had variants of those. But for the most part, from a wiring standpoint, it was a 4L60E or 4L80E. Um, those transmissions inherently need to have their vehicle speed just so they can shift. Correct. That's how they determine when to shift because the tables inside the computer are based on vehicle speed in order to shift up or shift down. Um, the other thing to note with that is let's say you're running a Turbo 350, Turbo 400, the Power Glide, any non-electronic automatic as we call it. Uh, again, that's going to be similar to your manual trans, whether it's a Z-Trans or a T56. Uh, we're going to accommodate that in the harness. Uh, you will have a VSS hookup. They do, people do sell VSS um, kits for the tail shaft of a Turbo 350 or Turbo 400, so you can get the signal from there. And um, it's just going to make tuning easier down the road. Yeah. And in, even in a case like running a 350Z transmission where there is no speed sensor in the transmission, there's actually a couple options there as well. LOJ sells a, um external speedometer pickup that it includes a reluctor wheel that goes onto the input yoke of the drive shaft, and it positions a universal Hall effect type sensor to get a get a speed up pulse off your drive shaft. 
Um, that works in any car that's an independent suspension because the drive shaft won't slide forward and backward in the yoke. If it was in a pickup truck, not a good option because the sensor will move away or whatever from the, the, the sensor pickup. Um, another option that we've used at LOJ, we actually do it on our shop car. Um, we pull vehicle speed for the PCM off of one of the ABS sensors. Um, it's Again, it, it doesn't really care as long as it's a two-wire Hall Effect type sensor. It's just wants pulses and it wants to know how many pulses are in a mile. And that's really what it comes down to. Yep. So. Um, and then the last topic's mass air sensors. I can hit on this a little and then you can expound, I'm sure. Sure. Um, you can essentially run any LS math on any LS PCM, if I understand correctly. The difference comes down to the frequency output uh, per gram of air that's passing through the mass air sensor. Yeah, re really, I mean, you know, a lot of people like the LS3 Gen 4 mass air sensor because it's, you know, it's a blade style. It's kind of a real clean install, you know, when you're, when you're all done. Um, it's, it's just a function. The tune has to match the mass air. Yep. And, you know, the, the key with mass airs, you know, whether it's a 5-pin LS2 or 5-pin truck or the blade style uh, LS3 or a 3-pin Camaro, um, the key to understand is, A, make sure the tune matches it, and B, make sure the placement is correct. Yep. Uh, don't, you know, sometimes it looks really cool to put it in a certain area, but if you don't have nice smooth laminar flow before and after it, you're going to get some funky readings, which are going to cause some drivability issues. And it could cause a drivability issue at, you know, 20% throttle in this temperature day. You know, yeah. it, it really, you need to understand that the vehicle, and it, this is important with all of the swap, the, the computer still thinks it's in the factory car. Yep. It has no idea it's in your Nissan. It has no idea it's in your Chevelle or your Camaro. Yep. It still thinks it's in the factory vehicle. And if things aren't hooked up that are supposed to be hooked up, or things are in, installed incorrectly, it's going to set, set fault codes. And if you have drive-by wire, it's going to kill the throttle. Yep. Um, and these are all things that you know PSI or LOJ can help customers with because... Um, there's really not good sources. There's not, there's not consistent sources out there for what works with what or why cars are doing certain things. And um, it, that's just important to keep in mind when you're doing these swaps. Yeah, something I'd like to add, too, about the LS3 blade-style mass air sensor, that, that's probably universally agreed to be one of the most difficult mass air sensors to tune. Um, it's very, very temperamental to diameter changes of the pipe that it's placed in, as well as John talked about the laminar flow through the mass air sensor. Um, if you've got a Gen 3 motor, there's even doubly no reason to run an LS3 sensor because an LS3 mass air sensor has a greater, people will say it has a higher horsepower reading capability, which it does. It can output higher frequencies than the Gen 3 LS1 or LS2 style mass air sensors. And you can program the PCM to read them, a Gen 3 computer. The problem is the Gen 3 computer has a ceiling on the highest frequency it can read. And the LS3 can read higher frequency or output higher frequencies than the Gen 3 computer can even read. So you're you're putting in a sensor with more capacity than your ECU can even understand. Which, That's you great. know, from a tuning or horsepower producing perspective, it doesn't make much sense. So why give yourself the headache of trying to tune an LS3 mass air sensor when you're getting no gain in it over a standard LS2 sensor? And the reason the LS2 sensors and LS1 sensors and truck sensors, for that matter, are all so great. Because they're in a body, that screen that's mounted on that math body and that diameter is strictly controlled from the factory that made that mass air sensor. It's calibrated. It greatly helps keep that flow laminar and keep the readings more consistent. They're just easier to tune. They have better drivability. Now, I still install LS3 mass air sensors in certain applications. It makes sense where you need the extra ceiling of horsepower reading and you'll deal with those tuning issues. But if you want to save yourself some headaches doing a swap, Take a step back from the aesthetics for a minute and just run like a truck style math or an LS2 style yeah. math. So or, or if you want to go speed density, you can well, do that yeah, as well. Just make sure you have a competent tuner that can tune in speed density. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that covers the bulk of Gen 3 uh, EFI issues. This was a pretty long video, I know for sure, but there's a lot of info to be covered. I'm sure we left a lot out, but those are like the, the key points that I'd like people to take away from this. And uh, later we'll have an LS, uh, a Gen 4 um, PCM wiring type video to help better understand what's going on with those motors. So.